Always a pleasure to be back at UWE, so thanks for having me again. Um, <coughs> here today to talk about uh, quite an interesting little uh, kind of pro bono research and development project that we're doing um, in Field and Clay Bradley uh, in partnership with the Church of England and the Heritage Lottery Fund. Um, we call it um, a, 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 a tiny project with a national significance. Um, maybe that's blowing our trumpet a little bit, but I don't know, let's see what you think about it. Um, I suppose I'll just start by saying, uh, in, as Matt mentioned in introduction, my interests are in um, conservation and existing buildings, historic buildings, listed buildings, um, but also in sort of sh uh, narrowing that perceived gap between kind of conservation architecture, which is often very technical and there's kind of right answers and wrong answers, and then kind of architectural design, which is obviously much more open and all the amazing stuff that you learn about here uh, in the studios. So we're really, really interested in the problems of existing buildings as a kind of a shared asset of all of us and how uh, macro level thinking uh, and architectural design can possibly help to, um, to solve some of those. Let's give that a go. Okay, bingo. All right. Uh, our Field and Clegg Bradley Studios, uh, based over in Bath, uh, I suspect you probably know of them, um, famous for kind of low energy and sustainable design, a lot of higher education stuff over the last 25 years or so. But within that, there's, um, there's a team uh, called uh, the Creative Reuse Team, who are the kind of like the, the history nerds who work with the existing buildings and the old buildings. Uh, this is the work we're doing currently at Bath Abbey, uh, the footprint project to unlock some of the, um, the, the subterranean vaults underneath the square there, put in some visitor centre stuff. Uh, more recently, uh, the other drawing is Manchester Cathedral. Uh, we won the competition for the West End redevelopment project there. So some pretty uh, big projects for sort of significant structures in the Church of England's portfolio. But um, we're also interested in the whole spectrum, really. You know, they're an interesting client um, and they've got... Uh, a lot of other problems rather than just um, you know at their biggest and most significant sites so um, I guess what we're talking about today is the problem of empty churches which is um, said by some people to be the biggest conservation challenge in the United Kingdom at the moment um, I'm sure you've all heard stories about kind of dwindling congregations who go to these um, isolated churches in rural locations um, very often they end up being uh, sold and deconsecrated and um, either passed on to the open market for conversion or even worse, um, they just fall apart until they're too unsafe and they get demolished. Uh, that's a real tragedy, uh, we think. So what, what can be done about unlocking this problem that seems to be uh, only getting a little bit worse? Uh, the Church of England are really aware of this because everybody keeps talking about it. Um, here's some great headlines. Rural vicars drowning amid the battle to keep empty churches open. That was independent and this chap, um, Giles Fraser, who's a columnist for The Guardian and also a vicar. Um, we must do to our churches what beaching did to the railways. I guess you guys know what beaching did to the railways, but he closed down as many of them as he could in the sort of 50s and 60s. Um, and kind of 50 years later, everyone thought that was a really, really terrible loss. But uh, at the time, it's about uh, being realistic about the economics of situations that they're in. Uh, I wouldn't normally do a slide full of stats, but these stats are really, really interesting to describe the problem. They just came out of a recent uh, white paper that the Church of England uh, published showing the extent of the issue. Number one, there are a lot of churches and most of them are in the middle of nowhere. So this is a particularly good one. 57% of all the churches in the Church of England are in rural areas where only 17% of the population actually live. So that kind of goes and shows the disparity there between the spread and where people are actually uh, dwelling. And the Church of England is responsible for the upkeep of 45% of England's grade one listed buildings. Giles Fraser there says, they're a millstone around our necks. The Church of England, uh, very often these churches uh, to administer the repairs to them is left to the vicar. And believe it or not, that is not why they joined the church to kind of look after drainage and rainwater pipes on listed buildings. They, they find it's distracting them from what they want to be doing. Number two, um, empty churches. Um, People are not going to worship uh, in the kind of traditional Christian liturgy as much as they used to. So it's now down to less than 2% of the UK population uh, attending a service every week. Um, and what this has meant realistically over the last 20 years is that 20 to 25 churches are closed every single year, which is a real shame. Nick Spencer, he's the director of a think tank who's been looking at this for a long time. He says, if you were running the church as a business, it would be quite simple. You would just close down the uneconomic branches. Uh, of course, they're not running it as a business. Um, what makes the Church of England a great client is that there's some things they think that are more important than money, but um, it also means they get themselves in a pickle every once in a while. Uh, finally, 
listed buildings are really, really expensive to maintain. Um, listed buildings belong to everybody, so when you uh, add a new door or you want to repair some stained glass, you've got to do it to the highest possible standard and you've got to meet some very strict um, regulations. And this just all adds up. So there you go. In 2006, they estimated they had almost a billion pounds worth of repair to do and they did not have a billion pounds spare. So Simon Jenkins put it best here, the church cannot afford to maintain what is the greatest legacy of England's local culture. And I think that's uh, a really, he's nailed it there. That's why these churches are important, uh, that idea of the legacy of the local culture. I mean, you think about the beautiful rolling pastoral landscape of England, um, as a, a thousand watercolors and oil paintings will attest, there's usually a spire in there somewhere. They're um, uh, an absolutely intrinsic piece of the way that we've inhabited the countryside uh, in, particularly in this country. <laughs> and if they were all slashed like beaching and torn down or given away, then um, I think uh, our nation would be impoverished because of that. On the inside, they're uh, just as beautiful and evocative, and they also you know, inspired generations of artists. Um, visiting local churches in the middle of the countryside is a, well, I wouldn't say it's a national pastime, but for a certain type of person, it's quite fun. Uh, if you are planning on practicing architecture in the UK, it's a good way to get to know the last 1,000 years of architectural development. Um, this is what happens if they get sold. Sometimes they get converted. Sometimes not all of the uses are particularly sympathetic. This is a favorite of mine. This is somewhere in Wales uh, where it was converted to an MOT garage. Uh, I particularly like that kind of breeze block column that flies up through the gallery there. Bit of a shame, but I don't know. Maybe it's still standing, so I mean, maybe it's a plus. Um, so finally, uh, churches are beloved. People do want them to stay. There is a, a, a kind of a ground swelling that uh, people don't want to see them lost. 85% of the population visit a church building every year. You know, you don't have to be a Christian to want to go and see your best mate get married or something. Um, and then that's not necessarily just, uh, you know, people of no religion. That's me, 62% of people of other faiths as well. Uh, there's a great quote here from Will Self, the author. He talks about why he likes churches. Um, uh, it's not necessarily prayer as it's commonly understood, but um, he goes there to think basically, to get a little bit of headspace. Um, and he does this because this is uh, why churches were built. They're ancient, they're evocative, they're beautiful, <laughs> and they give you a little bit of quiet time. Um, I'm particularly interested in that, and um, I think that's one of the reasons why this is such an important resource that we try and do our best to keep open as best as possible. Uh, a little bit of a tangent now. I'm going to take you back to 2008. This is a project that Field and Clay Bradley Studios ran called the Field Barn Project. Uh, I wasn't with FCB then, so this is all before my time, but um, uh, I'm aware of it, and it's a very interesting piece of work. Again, it was self-funded research and development. Um, looking at tackling uh, a seemingly impossible um, conservation issue. In this instance, uh, agricultural buildings in the Yorkshire Dales National Park. Um, there are literally thousands of these beautiful tiny little barns. The uh, contemporary agricultural practice has far outgrown them. They're not required anymore and they're locked in by the planning system that says, you know, you can't convert them. You can't lay a new uh, mains line to them. They won't get broadband and you can't park your Audi outside them. So, you know, you can't really convert them very, very easily, and they're all stuck in the middle of a field as well. So, uh, the proposal that FCB came up with, kind of in partnership with the Dales National, National, National Park and a few other um, interested parties, was to kind of agree a temporary lax on the planning conditions and put in a, um, a reversible, what they called an ecopod, a uh, lightweight, um, sort of inert uh, new structure that would sit inside the barn, very much like the diagram there on the right, and provide overnight accommodation for walkers and ramblers and people who use the national park anyway. Uh, the idea there was that um, it's temporary and reversible, so you know, there's no long-term damage to the, uh, to the landscape or to the listed buildings. Um, income then is generated from the people who are staying. That money pays for the repairs. The building gets repaired, and when it's finished, you can either take down and move the pod on somewhere else, or you can just completely recycle it. And then what you're left with is the original building, Still not really used for agriculture, but you know, not going to fall on anyone anymore, and that's, that's got to be a good thing. So that was um, an interesting piece of work, and that culminated with a, a pilot build. That was um, all the materials and time there were donated by Clifton Conservation, and the whole the consultant team were kind of volunteering their efforts there, and they went up there and built this thing, um, which I believe is still there and has been used uh, at least a couple of times. It was an interesting um, provocation of a project, really. And it, um, 
has is still going. You know, uh, Bolton Abbey Estate and uh, a great vast swathe of the land up there, and they have many of these barns on it. So they um, uh, have kind of picked it up and are running with it. But it's this project that FCB kind of birthed and bequeathed to the world. So we're not really involved with it anymore, but it's just a, an interesting idea. Lots of great feedback. National Trust thought it was cool. Prince's Regeneration Trust, English Heritage, all these people um, kind of got behind it. And uh, there you go. There's the sort of um, the positives that come out of that. Now, I'm sure you could probably see where I'm going with this, but uh, not long after that project was published, the Church of England approached us and said, you know, have you ever thought about putting one of these in a church, maybe? Um, a lot of the same problems. Um, you can't very easily convert them because of uh, planning and listed building consent issues. Um, really, they just need um, a baseline of income coming in to allow uh, the, the upkeep of the building. Uh, so reversibility and thinking about the longer term uh, is really important there. And um, what am I? So that's basically where they came to. And, and there, I suppose the important thing to think about is, is it's just the scope is much, much bigger. You know, it's, it's nationwide. There's thousands of buildings and the stakes are much higher. You know, thinking about a billion pounds worth of repair and things like that. So the uh, church pod project was born thinking about how you might... Um, put uh, house temporary other uses in underused churches. This is a great painting. This is St. Jerome in his study. There he is. He's put himself a little pod in and he's translating the Bible into Latin in an otherwise very underused nave. So there you go. That just goes to show that there's no new ideas under the sun. Um, that project uh, became known as the Virtuous Circles Project by the, uh, the Church of England. So we started running it in partnership with them. Uh, again, um, myself and a couple of colleagues were very much donating our time on a pro bono basis to kind of tickle along this um, with a view to seeing where it goes. Um, the important thing to remember then about this um, is that there are two strands to the Virtuous Circles Project. Is that going to work? Yeah, very good. OK, there's one there, which is uh, looking at a specific individual church. And then there's the sort of the wider overarching kind of master plan for how this could potentially roll out across the entire country and, I don't know, crack that problem we were talking about earlier. This is the kind of really important bit, though. Um, church of England doesn't have loads of money, and uh, the starting point is repairing your first dilapidated church. So we've been working with the HLF to kind of get a grant together to do a pilot project that's going to test this theory. Uh, we're going to repair the church, we're going to put the new shared use in, there's going to be loads of rural regeneration, going to get loads of money going to pay for more maintenance, the church is going to be great. And then, you know, the idea is that you might siphon some of that money off slowly to form a seed fund, which could then, you know, perhaps start the next project, either with maybe some more grant funding or from other places as well. And then that kind of rolls out this um, continuous cycle. Some of the things that does then, uh, this is a little diagram we produced that show the kind of the three main threads there. There's the church's objectives. Brilliant, you know, they retain some space for prayer, they start easing their financial burden, and they reduce the strain on the clergy. There's the community objectives, you know, this is great, this re reconnects people with their heritage, uh, it reinstates the church as more of a civic space, you know, slightly less intimidating. And then the economics objectives as well, there's new spending in the local economy, potentially, you know, spaces for business startups, new jobs as well. There's a, there's a wide range of kind of good news that might come out of this. And thinking about churches, where they are, what they look like, how you might inhabit them, and what that sort of spread of new uses could potentially be. It's just a little matrix diagram explaining how, you know, from the smallest ones in the middle of nowhere as a kind of a tourist retreat um, to, up, you know, the big ones that are in the city centre, what, what might the kind of spread of new potential uses be and how might these uh, lend themselves to different uh, types of mixtures of use. So this is the rule book, uh, the approaches. Uh, discretion, reversibility, very much as per the field barn concepts. Curation we're particularly interested in. Um, how might, you know, by ana analysing the significance of the space, how might you actually contribute positively to it rather than, you know, detrimentally? Uh, you can have a, you know, you're really adding to the sense of the church and its interpretation. And then the most important one is the retention, because that's what it's all about. Uh, the, the chancel, the most sacred end of the church, remaining unaltered and available for quiet contemplation and prayer. Not necessarily services anymore, but um, uh, the ability for members of the public to get inside the church and use it for the reason that it was built. So that's why we keep calling it a shared use and a kind of a mixture of uses. It's making sure that stays, because if that, if that doesn't stay anymore, then it's just a church conversion project um, like that garage in Wales. We're, we're sort of trying not to get down there. So the interesting thing uh, about churches, uh, I suppose, is that they're all broadly the same. They've kind of got the same stuff in them. There's like an altar at that end, and there's like a door at that end. 
and there's you know, transepts and naves and stuff. Um, and they're all broadly sort of in the similar arrangement, but actually they're really, really different. There's no two that are the same. Um, and it's those, the way that they're different often that makes them significant and makes them you know, interesting for people who, uh, who visit churches. This is a page out of Bannister Fletcher who's just drawn um, a bunch of Christopher Wren city churches in London. You know, same architect, same client, same brief, and like so many interesting different buildings came out of it. So what this suggests is you're unlikely to be able to design a one-size-fits-all, off-the-peg solution for putting something in a church that can help unlock these new uses. Instead, probably what we're looking at is, uh, is what we call the rule book, you know, what a series of design rules that might uh, go on to inform how you might put something in a space. So this is a typical church, I guess. It's got some stuff you'd recognise. That's the nave, that's the chancel, transepts, aisles. Maybe it's got a porch. If you're lucky, it might even have a tower, vestries and stuff at the other end. Um, this, uh, this is a really, really important line. I'm going to talk a little bit now about um, kind of the liturgical significances of these churches. This is uh, historically with the chancel arch. This separates the kind of the end where the clergy do the sacred stuff from the end where uh, the, the common people come to observe. Um, you know, throughout history, this might have been screened off, might have been open, there might have been lofts and all sorts on this line, but this is a really significant divide in the church. Um, east, uh, sorry, west to east, I should say, is uh, the ceremonial axis down the middle of the aisle. Um, it's probably a ceremonial door in the west end where you might go through on kind of Easter and important festivals. Uh, and the, uh, the east then with a the big window and uh, the altar being the most important sacred part. Um, not actually true uh, east-west orientation. It's um, usually what they call ecclesiastical east, which is just slightly off. And it's about the alignment of the sun rising on Easter. Uh, and this is uh, the kind of the thou shalt not touch end. This is a few steps up and there's a kind of ceremonial table and usually some interesting carving around the back of the, uh, back of the altar as well. Some churches might have a font. Uh, that, that usually happens somewhere over here. That's quite interesting. It's about um, your spiritual entry into the church, you know, when you're baptised or confirmed. Um, that happens down at the West End as well. So uh, further to all the obvious conservation uh, challenges you have, like, you know, careful not to knock out any windows, don't necessarily need to put any new doors and if you can help it, you get this sort of um, liturgical significances as well that the design has to respect. And I guess you could say it's just the kind of uh, the cultural baggage that comes with some of these buildings that have been uh, used in a certain way for so long. In terms of precedents, we're really interested in um, that historically, probably the naves of churches would have been uh, much more public in the way that they were accessed and used. Often they were sort of extensions of town squares. This is a great engraving of Bath Abbey before they put the pews in. And actually people used to walk through the North Isle there as a bit of a shortcut between, um, between the two parts of town. Uh, and this was a really enlivened sort of public space where people would come and meet and be seen and even you know, trade or you know, various other activities. And this is a famous map of uh, Rome, which uh, is a figure ground plan showing the buildings and the streets and the squares. But um, it also shows all of the churches as extensions of those squares. And these are you know, really illustrating this as a public space that belongs to everybody. So is that maybe where to start thinking about these churches? Uh, they're, they're not all sacred buildings. They're a public building with like a little sacred bit inside it. Uh, loads of really, really fascinating precedents for how you might put new things in churches from the kind of the legacy of English church furniture design. Um, we're very interested in how whatever pod or intervention might go into the church could be perceived as a piece of furniture, very much like some of these. You know, like choir galleries, organ lofts, box pews, those are the sort of classic ones. Uh, this is beautiful, this kind of uh, descending stepped pulpit that's like a triple decker of preaching that allowed the kind of the, the vicar to sort of stand here and see everyone and be seen by everybody, interested in that. You know, screens were really, really important, dividing space but allowing visibility through starting to really frame views of the interiors and some of the monuments. Fantastic old gallery there. Very, very un-DDA compliant. Um, this is St. Albans Cathedral, the watching loft. You know, I don't even know what a watching loft was for, but it's really cool. It's like up here at first floor, there's like a little ladder at the back, and I guess someone was up here kind of keeping an eye that no one was mishandling all the relics or something. But um, this is very typical of the kind of thing you see from uh, medieval church furniture, you know, panels, tracery primary elements, some are open, some are blind. 
um, a very, very interesting and rich kind of typology there to draw on. And then, and then like the outrageous sort of Renaissance and Baroque stuff where you've got, you know, box pews on top of box pews and, you know, kind of Corinthian orders flying around. There's loads of stuff to get really, really excited about. Okay, so church pods, yeah, we had a client who was interested and we had a concept we thought might work. The thing that we were missing was a church to sort of try it out on. So um, we devised a pilot project. We talked to the Church of England and we said, um, you know, where, where do you think we might be able to do this? Do you think you know anyone who's up for it? And they said, well, you should talk to Hereford Diocese because they're um, really, really open-minded. They've got a great switched on team there who have done some interesting church conversions in the past. And they're always looking to be at the forefront of this sort of discussion. Um, also, uh, statistically, they are the most sparsely populated uh, diocese in the country and they have 780 people per church building. That's bonkers, isn't it? And that's almost half as much as the next smallest, which is Ipswich, that has 1,379. So lots of churches, not very many people, and um, really typical of the areas that are most struggling with this problem. Rang them up and straight away they said, yep, you know, we've got so many churches you could do this in, come and have a look at them. They put four forward already. These are really, really interesting. They're all uh, very typical of the churches that are most at risk. They're all Victorian, um, which in church terms means they're not that old, even though they're about 150 years old. Um, they're all grade two listed, which means in church terms, you know, they're not that listed. Um, they're, they're the ones that are most at risk. Uh, they're not where they are spending their meager funds and get focusing their energies. And uh, this is the one we chose, St. Michael's and All Saints in a little town called Doulas. Uh, chose it because it's the sort of uh, smallest, we thought at the time it was in the best structural condition. <laughs> Not that it didn't turn out that way. Um, and it was, you know, it had a very favorable context in terms of um, where it was located. Thinking back to that matrix I showed you of the, sort of the possible uses, we, uh, we had a kind of a vague inkling we were gonna go with the field barn typology of a, a kind of a rural retreat or a walker's accommodation. Uh, so in that respect, Herefordshire is absolutely beautiful for this. This is um, an area they call the Golden Valley. It's between Hereford, Abergavenny and Hay on Wye, and it is absolutely stunning. Uh, that's where Doulas is, right on the English side of the border there. And that's the church, just sort of nestled down in the bottom of this very beautiful idyllic valley. Um, sadly, JMW Turner died just five years before he got a chance to paint it, but I'm sure he would have thought it was ace. On the inside, um, reasonably unremarkable, 1865. Um, you know, it's got some interesting uh, features, but um, compared to other buildings in the Church of England's portfolio, not exactly uh, one to scream and shout about. Interesting history. Uh, this was the local landowner, Doulas Courts, now an old people's home, but at the time, the chap who owned it had a lovely medieval church here, but the story goes he didn't like watching people getting buried while he was having his dinner, so he demolished it and built a new one over here. So 1865, that was when that went up. Very simple arrangement, what we call a two-cell, nave, uh, chancel over here with some steps up, big generous arch, a little vestry on this side, a little porch over here. A couple of interesting features such as, you know, slightly larger north windows and the little lancets on the south creates a nice sort of even light when you're inside. It's got a few interesting features. Uh, 13th century bell came from the old church. Some 16th century carvings, they came from the old church. Uh, we wrapped up and moved on the, uh, uh, the organ there to a a uh, church that might actually get some use out of it. So uh, we've put all these into storage while we approach the next stage of the project. So we had the team, we had the idea, we had the church. We put in a HLF round one bid, um, which is basically for a little bit of money to pay for what they call the development phase. Uh, it pays for consultants to come on board and help really get everything watertight so that you can go back and do the big bid and get the big check at the end. That's the HLF round two. So we were successful. That paid for um, a project manager to come on and do all of the stuff that we didn't necessarily have all the time to do. Um, there's loads of things that you need to do before you go back to the HLF round two. It's you know, your conservation management plan, your maintenance management plan, your activity plan. How, how is this gonna benefit the community and everybody? Why should the HLF give you the money? Uh, and also importantly for us as the architects, you need to have your list of building consents and your planning permissions in order. So that was the kind of the big action that was on us there. All right, so on to the proposals, putting a pod in Doulas, St. Michael's. Uh, before you can do that, you need to talk about repair. 
uh, and this church uh, needed a lot of it. This is where the bulk of the HLF's money is going to go. We reckon there's going to be about a half million quid in the grant and probably almost 400,000 of that's going to go on uh, just making the building watertight and safe. Roof, lovely uh, stones, slates, uh, stone tiles there in diminishing courses. Loads of them have fallen off. Water was pissing in. It was full of bats. Really, really dangerous. Um, big chunks of original lath and plaster falling down on the inside. Water trickles down, all of the rafter footings and the, um, the, kind of the, the wall plates there, you know, soggy enough to kind of push a finger through. Um, badly tied trusses on a very steeply sloped pitch. A little bit of movement in the walls, twisting in the rafters. Um, not ideal. Uh, add to that a belfry that's full of iron that's expanding and rusting. Uh, with big chunks falling off. They took the bell down because it was particularly precarious, but uh, that needs to be rebuilt from scratch. Um, this was an interesting one. In 2008, when they closed the church, they put this fence around it so that people wouldn't get too close to it and have a tile fall on their head. Um, great idea, but what it did mean was that the, uh, the chap who came and mowed the lawn every two weeks couldn't get to the building anymore. And uh, we had eight years of undergrowth kind of uh, consuming the building and keeping lots and lots of water by the foundations of the building. Uh, and that really did start to take its toll. So what you get is um, a lot of kind of movement that's difficult to model and difficult to predict. And it's usually the, uh, the ashlar stonework, uh, the ones with the very, very fine joints where that starts to show uh, as the, the building kind of flexes, the masonry flexes, the, the lime mortar of the rubble stone kind of gives it a little bit of movement. But here, uh, these kind of better carved pieces just, just can't handle it and they start to blow their surfaces. So a lot of precarious looking tracery in all of the arches as well, you know, big chunks of the kind of surface really coming away. So a great deal of masonry repair to go in there as well. Thinking about the church then, thinking about that rule book and how all churches are different, what are the significant things about our church? We did a little bit of analysis on this. This is the plan, this is the section. Um, the, the, the green is that chancel end that we want to keep unaltered and the blue is the area where we think a, a pod or pods might reasonably go. We're really interested in this action where you come in through the porch and you sort of turn left and you get this killer view uh, up to the east end and the altar. Um, and we're really, really keen that this pod isn't too big. It doesn't dominate the nave and it doesn't disturb some of these views so that when you're standing inside the church, you know, you can look up and you can see that you are inside a church with a piece that's been added to it and not, you're not inside a converted church and you can't get a sense of what you're looking at. That's really uh, the outcome of that. Interesting as well, we didn't find out until we saw the survey that actually the, the nave is as tall as it is wide. It's like a perfect square. Um, yeah, fascinating little things you kind of discover when you delve a little bit deeper. Um, thinking about that sharing of use, there was an early idea from the client that you might build a physical divide here on the chancel arch that allowed people to come and go as they please through the vestry door into the chancel and people to come and go as they please through the porch into the nave and it kind of operates as a uh, like a semi-detached house I suppose um, and I think we were just really really keen that didn't happen it's such a small church it's the two cell arrangement you know that uh, sense of the connection between the chancel and nave was one of those significances that we didn't want to see lost so we managed to persuade them against that, but what that meant was that um, uh, you had to share use, basically. There are times when this is fully occupied by the people who are staying overnight, and there are times when it's fully occupied by the people who are coming to visit the church and pray in the chancel. So that's something we're still kind of ironing out as we go on a little bit more. Thinking about this pod then, where's it gonna go? That's the, um, the internal elevation of the south and the east. Um, you might have seen that sort of that wedge shape we kind of uh, saw on that significance diagram. We're thinking about putting the higher spaces of a two-story pod over in the east end, uh, as far away from the chancel as possible, sorry, the west end, I should say. Um, so when you look at the west end, you know, it's also the area that's best suited with its fenestration for laying some kind of uh, floor levels out. So you have a first floor that's just sitting on the sill of these windows, and then a kind of a roof line that doesn't uh, interfere with the rows either. There's a nice opportunity as well to pick up the chancel datum as a kind of a raised plinth as well that you might step up onto this pod and have a sort of a bit of a dialogue with what's happening over there. In terms of the vertical layout, we were really, really keen that you should be able to get all the way around this thing. It should be freestanding in the middle. Um, there's numerous examples of pods and furniture that have gone into churches and they have the kind of the, the 75 millimeter gap at the side and it just gets full of dust bunnies and packets of crisps and stuff and it's uh, generally not good. So we wanted to avoid that, um, stepping it away as well, 
here to get that kind of view of that Lancet window when you come in through the door. So this is the sort of the area of where that pod might go, thinking about all of these different um, uh, things that we wanted to retain that were special about the church and the, and the different sort of parameters there. And thinking again about that wedge, standing here and enjoying as much of an interior as possible, you can kind of start to see the intervention as a series of stacked cabins, almost uh, slightly off each other, overlapping. And then uh, just in, in the short section there, um, there's a, you know, a much larger bedroom cabin on the ground floor, and then above that, uh, a smaller kind of living cabin that you center on the one window, and that leaves the other window uh, available for the view out to the main space. So just kind of thinking about a bit more carefully about what we cover up and what we show and what are the important datums that we center our spaces on. Um, and that's, that's what we got when we came out of that. That's our pod. It's a sort of a series of stacked cubes. We were quite excited about that, um, that almost kind of classical square in section and how this might be a series of sort of quite classical shapes, you know, the, the, the tumbling cubes. Uh, and also thinking when designing it about how this thing's going to work in two modes. One, when people come in and, you know, want to go up here and use the uh, kind of the, the elevated living deck, but then also when it's not being used, you know, how this closes down. So this door here closes and it becomes quite a quiet and mute presence in the space. You know, none of this is available. And um, this, how these steps here, this raised plinth, might start to have a relationship with the chancel and create, you know, possibly one day uh, community uses in here, lectures, performances, just a place to sort of sit and look at that East End. Uh, that all makes it sound really, really quick. Uh, of course, there were loads of iterations we went through there um, to get to that. That's the plan. Here it is, sitting down here, tucked into this corner to retain that kind of view, that important view there. Um, we split the pods. Bedroom uh, in here at ground floor, follow this around up to the first floor living here. The living split, half of it's outside with the fire, half of it's inside in the super insulated pod there as well. So you can close that off when it's really, really cold. Uh, this is what we call the service pod. It's um, above a kind of a slight, like a boiler, boiler room uh, underneath the vestry and it connects directly to the, where the trenching is coming in. So perfect place to put your kitchen and your, um, your other toilet uh, over here. And also this can use, be worked slightly autonomously to support community uses in here when this is all shut down. Uh, one of the things to quickly touch on, I suppose, is this idea of how much of these spaces should be outside and in the church and how many of them should be inside cabins within the church where you look out through windows. We wanted as much as possible to happen in the church because it's, you know, it's a church pod, people's paying to stay in a church. It'd be a shame to have everything closed off, but um, there are a few issues, with, particularly with thermal comfort, that we will talk a little bit about later on. Um, one of the things the HLF money financed for us was market research. Uh, we paid to go and do some, find out who's going to Hereford, what sort of places are they staying at. So while we were thinking, we were designing something for these guys, you know, with like wet dogs, and they're coming at the end of the day and like put their pack down, actually, uh, we need to be targeting these guys a little bit more. Um, unsurprisingly, the feedback came back and said the most lucrative market to aim at is a cosmopolitan couples weekend retreats flying away from London to the lovely countryside. They love kooky new experiences and staying in a church might just be one of them. So that was like a, a really important shift in our thinking. You know, we thought this was going to be very Spartan, very robust, much more like a hostel. And actually suddenly it had to be slightly more of a higher standard of finish, particularly when it came to the servicing as well. Um, you can't really go back to the HLF with a business case and say you chose not to listen to the market research. So um, we, we decided to change our thinking at our end and kind of deal with that. Um, and there's just a couple of views. That's what you see when you look back. That's it in, um, uh, I mean, we, we are kind of looking at that boutique -y end, I suppose. But um, to us, that doesn't, it's not necessarily um, incompatible with the idea of it being a kind of contemplative space, a retreat. Perhaps the kind of people who are drawn to staying in here are Christians. You know, maybe they do want to come and spend a weekend in a church where they can sleep and they can kind of use these chancel areas uh, for a slightly more relaxed and quiet spiritual uh, experience. And then that's the view you get when you come in through the door, managed to chuck everything over to one side and just get that view up to the Veridos there, um, thinking about kind of you know, how a lower piece here opens up that view and sort of the permeability of some of these um, uh, railings and things. Um, how am I doing on time? Probably pick it up a touch. Uh, M&E and servicing, this is a, a big one that the field barn never really had to deal with. It was totally off grid. We, uh, because we're aiming for that slightly higher standard of, um, of accommodation, suddenly it became a big issue. So this is, um, we've been data logging the church for the last year. Uh, spiky blue is outside, the other three are inside. This is a good kind of display of that sort of thermal mass 
of a, of a solid masonry church and how those kind of highs and lows spikes really kind of like ebb out to a kind of a standard, slightly cold 16 degrees most of the time. Um, this is how, uh, you know, achieving 21 degrees inside your cabins, dead easy, super insulated, very airtight, not a problem. Um, but inside your church, you know, here's the year here, really for a little bit in July, it's quite nice inside. For the rest of the time, it's really, really bloody cold. Um, that, uh, we did a little bit of work thinking about how you might be able to achieve that, you know, could you dig up the entire floor, put underfloor heating in it? That's a sort of popular model for providing heating in these churches. And even then, you know, it's, it's not enough due to the height of this space and the unknowns around its kind of single glazing and the roof structure and things. Um, it's always going to be a little bit cold. So that's why we're thinking a little bit more about um, sort of other means of providing heat. You know, in some of those decks, you get underfloor heating just to kind of create local pools of sort of warmth that people can congregate in. And of course, the, um, we showed the wood burning stove as well being an important part. So uh, we're still keen to retain that sense that you are in a church. And yes, I guess sometimes you're going to have to just wear your woolly jumper in the evenings. That's the servicing strategy, um, and again, this is with one eye on the, um, the uh, possible wider rollout with a kind of a, a master pod, a core pod, and a slave pod. This one connects into everything, thinking about kind of renewables. In this instance, we're not going to look at any solar PV, sadly. That was the feedback from the, um, the, the council. Um, so we're looking at kind of like heat pumps and other sort of renewables that connect into a core pod, and then a kind of a flexible umbilical cord that uh, allows you to be a little bit more remote with the second living pod. And that's, again, thing like this idea of which bits are warm and which bits heat up what. Uh, big problem we had with services was ecology. Um, because this has been undisturbed from agricultural land for so long, uh, we have hundreds of species of ferns and orchids and like bats and things that live in these areas. That's a real challenge. Also, there's these guys, you can't dig around them either. The graves that exist is still a live graveyard, so people can, can still come and be um, buried here. So that really just gave us one opportunity for getting services in and out, and that's everything comes up the driveway. We know this was a central um, uh, part of the design in 1865, so no burials or anything underneath there. And that's where everything has to come in and everything has to go out. Progress, then. Um, where have we got to? Um, we've got a design. We've bashed it in for planning and list of building consent. Um, uh, the consultees are broadly very interested in it and very happy. They think it looks good. A um, few things that are hanging out are ownership and operation. Um, who is going to run this thing when it opens? We talked about um, making this you know, less distracting for the church rather than more distracting. Um, they don't really do hospitality industry, so they don't want to run it. Um, these are some guys we've talked to, Church Conservation Trust, English Heritage Landmark Trust particularly, do this sort of thing. It's what they do, and they're interested in possibly taking it on. So that's kind of... Slightly an unknown at the moment. We talked a little bit about the market research and the visitor expectation and being able to manage what we can feasibly accomplish inside uh, an ancient church. And hopefully the, the kind of the, the PR kudos or the kind of the quirkiness of that as a, as a new op opportunity for accommodation will outweigh some of those. Stability and structure. We talked about the, the roof and the movement in the walls. Lots going on there. We're working with Man Williams doing lots of these kind of little sort of sketch details for how you repair bits of stone and Syntec anchors and stainless steel rods and things. De-risking in the HLF, that's the main thing they, uh, they don't want to see when you come back is risk. So endless surveys, ecology <coughs> survey, bat survey, tree survey, drainage survey, traffic survey, um, just trying to figure out everything that could possibly go wrong and just make sure there's no question marks when we go back. And yes, we have lots of bats and we have to make sure that they're well catered for when we put the roof back on. Uh, the activity plan and engagement plan is an interesting one. The HLF insist upon it is um, how are you going to engage communities and how are other people going to benefit from the money? Now, the issue here, and it will be an issue in other rural churches, is there really isn't a um, community as such. You know, if there was a community, it probably wouldn't be in the situation that it is now. So we're looking at kind of other ways of managing that. This is the SPAB Maintenance Cooperative, some good guys who get together and um, help um, uh, repair and maintain churches. We got them out. They dug away all the undergrowth for us in that Harris fence. Um, we're looking at ways that uh, the works might be an opportunity for skilling people up. Uh, apprenticeships, you know, come and learn days where people can get their hands on some tools and learn some heritage, heritage skills. So that's, that's where we are. The HLF round one application was summer 2015. You get two years to kind of get it back in. So we've got a deadline looming summer 2017. 
The consents we've done, planning list of building consent, also faculty is the church's own permission system that has to go to kind of church house and they have to make sure everything's okay. That's all in and we're going to get a determination on that in March, hopefully. Got a lovely letter from John Yates, Historic England, who thinks it's a good idea and it's a, he says it's interesting here. It's, it's probably not the answer, but it will be a valuable addition to the range of options, which I think is um, probably you know, what we've learned from the system is there is no answer to all of these churches' problems, but if we're adding something to the discussion, then that's got to be worthwhile. I'll just end by saying we did do a little, another little bit of project off the back of this. We were thinking about you know, this, and the, we, we, we did the rule book, and we were quite interested in it, and we looked at that small rural church. So we were thinking, wouldn't it be interesting to look at a big urban church and what that might do uh, in terms of a use? And at the same time, we were invited by the um, New London Architecture, uh, who are doing a new exhibition called Work London, inviting architects to give suggestions for what the future of office space might be in the capital. And we said, well, you know, what if we had a big London church that could be an office? What, what might that look like? So we did a little piece of work for that. Um, this is uh, Islington, uh, Holy Trinity. It's owned by the Church's Conservation Trust. Very, very big, very, very empty, very much needs a new use. Um, so we just kind of did some drawings of that. And again, we did the rule book, you know, thinking of the, some of those things that we liked about the first instance, this wedge that allowed you to kind of read the space but still stack kind of accommodation up to one end, how you might uh, inhabit those aisles with sort of smaller individual units in a kind of office environment. You know, a cranked staircase that you know, allows people to touch down and cross-pollinate. Basically just ripped off Chipperfield in Glasgow. Uh, that's what that might look like. Um, and we submitted that and um, we went over to London to talk about it as well. There's a couple of uh, CGI's there. I suppose the interesting thing we did here that we didn't do in Dulas was we flipped it. Uh, in Dulas, the, uh, the wedge reversed up against the west end and faced the chancel. But here we flipped it and it reverses up against the chancel. And what that does is it creates a nice screen uh, partitioning off uh, the quiet contemplation bit, which uh, due to the size and its location can be open 24 hours a day for people to come and pray, and it also provides a little bit of a buffer with what is otherwise going to be a very, quite a noisy environment. And that's another view kind of looking back there along the church. Um, yeah, so there you go, virtuous circles. Uh, in terms of next steps, um, hopefully we'll get the HLF round two money uh, and we will work our little socks off to get stage four information together uh, with a view probably to build it or start the repair works this time next year. Um, and, you know, thinking about how this might roll out uh, to, to more and more churches. If it's successful, people probably come out of the woodwork and say it could be applicable to them. We sort of think, you know, we do, it's probably not appropriate for us to design a million of these for the rest of our career. But what, you know, what we might end up doing is doing a sort of a design guide, you know, kind of publishing that rule book um, uh, and then church house the church of england can work with individual you know architectures and design teams around the country to to repair their churches and it's i don't know possibly an option but there you go that's church pods